So welcome to our Conceptualizing Your Business Boomerworks meeting. I'm Shira Lotzar. I'm happy to be your host. I'm actually a co-founder of Boomerworks and lovely to see everyone here. I know we have some familiar faces and some new faces. And uh, today we're going to start helping y'all to make this big shift, right? So this, we address uh, mostly the 50 plus community, although all are welcome here, uh, but we do really have a, a sensitivity toward people who've been in the professional workplace for many, many years and are saying, okay, is it time to make a pivot, all right? Um, and is it time to think about how to earn additional income beyond W-2 employment? And as we know, age discrimination, yes, is alive and well. And that is actually the reason why uh, we founded this organization is a solution, a solution to ageism. I mean, flat out, right? Because we are, most of us are working for many more years than the W-2 market would necessarily have us work. And so we need to learn how to generate other forms of income. And self-employment is one of the ways to do that. And there are lots of ways to be self-employed, but most people who've been working for years, like all of us on this call, may be wondering, how do I do this? I have lots of skills. I have lots of talents. How in the world do I repurpose this into meaningful income, right? Okay, so to kick things off, I am going to... Uh, to really help you all think about um, the, the 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 some of the challenges, right, and the mindsets that a lot of people have with self-employment. So here we go. I'm going to take you through take you through this. Okay. So what would you think would be some of the cons, when you think about pros and cons of shifting into self-employment, and you're welcome to, to um, because I won't be able to see the chat as much, um, you're just welcome to open up your, your line and just yell out, what do you think are some of the cons, some of the, the risks, if you will, of, of being self-employed? Uh, sure, can I ask you something? Uh, you mentioned that there's a difference between self-employment and entrepreneurship. So can you go over that? What's the difference? Yeah, sure. And this is a subtle thing, and this is not a, a, an encyclopedia definition. This is my own uh, framing of this. When I think of self-employment, I think of entrepreneurship. I think self-employment is simply not having a W-2 job. So any sort of any sort of work where you are earning money for yourself, you're not working for an employer. When I think of an entrepreneur, I think of somebody who um, wants to scale a business. Okay, um, and I, I it's somebody who is um, uh, very competitive, who is looking to have a sort of a, a larger enterprise. Um, who is his, uh, wants to aggressively go after the market, not necessarily just to earn income, but to earn, to, to grow something. Okay, now, again, that's a very simplistic way of saying it. And there are people who might differ with how I'm thinking. And it's not to say you can't all call yourself entrepreneurs because sure you can. But generally, I think of someone who's going to lean into growing and scaling something a little larger. Does that help, Daniel? And is it Danielle? Yeah, perfect. Because I was, yes, yeah. yeah, Danielle. I was uh, just wondering if I'm an entrepreneur or not. So or self it classifies yeah. me as an, yeah, it yeah. classifies me as an entrepreneur because yeah. and, uh, and I actually, recently I'm gonna just make a did open a business. And I'm going to make a distinction in, in this, in this presentation where we're going to, I'm not going to mention entrepreneurship, but I am going to mention um, free, the difference between freelance work and having a small business that I, that distinction I'm going to make a little bit. In just a bit. So thank you for the question. So going back to risks, what are some of the risks or the cons? Uh, if you could just, just open up your mic and just shout it out. Lack of stable income. Lack of stable income. What else? No benefits. No benefits. Spreading yourself too thin across multiple things. Thin. Mm -hmm. What else? Well, initially you have to usually put in a lot of hours. Mm -hmm. Yep. Can take, absolutely take a lot of hours for sure. What else? Undercharging for your services. Yeah, for sure. Which by the way, not for nothing. Um, that is one of the biggest issues I think, because what a lot of people don't realize is that when you are paid a W-2 salary, when I say W-2, I mean, traditional full-time employment, people don't realize how little you are being paid. Wages have been flat in the U.S. The wages have been flat and falling in this country for about 40 years. And when an employer pays you, they, they tend to depress the salaries. So what will happen is you leave a job, somebody else gets hired in your place, and maybe you were here, you started here, you went to here, and then they'll try to often take the, take the salary back down to where you were, roughly speaking. Or they'll do salary surveys, and everybody sort of talks amongst themselves and says, okay, what is the salary? 
and they keep saying the same thing. So we don't have a whole lot of market movement. And plus the employer's taking a lot of profit. When you're self-employed, all bets are off there, right? High risk, high reward. You can charge a whole lot more than what you're making. And I'll say one more thing about this, then we'll keep going. I am pretty passionate about this topic. If you are making a hundred thousand dollar salary, let's just say that you are actually only being paid $50 an hour. I don't know if people realize that. So you take your salary and you sort of divide it in two. That's really your hourly rate. Whereas a hundred thousand dollar person could be charging, um, you know, a hundred dollars or two fifty an hour or what have you, depending on the kind of work that you're doing. If you're doing consulting, for example, that is a, that is a multiplier that a lot of people don't realize. So Greg, the undercharging thing is very, very real. And I really like helping encourage people actually you can charge a whole lot more. You're not charging your hourly rate of a W2. You need to charge a more market, but that's another topic. But thank you for bringing that up. Um, other risks, cons, things that would prevent people from going self-employed. Startup costs. I apologize. Startup costs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could be, could be. What else? Competition. Competition. Yeah. Anything else? The stress. Stress, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. So here's just a few of the ones that I came up with. And I think a lot of you have mentioned this unpredictable income. I don't know how to market myself. Don't have paid benefits. Might have to tap into my personal savings and risk averse and a million other things, right? This is just a few things. And look, it's not that these things are um, untrue necessarily, but some of them need to be reframed. And so I want to ask you, what do you think are some of the positives? Of being self-employed picking so, your own clients <laughs> say that one more time oh picking your own clients picking that's why own I clients. Mm -hmm. yeah because sure. i work for lawyers and i just want to pick my own clients because they're right. impossible <laughs> yeah. well, what have, else you have greater time flexibility flexibility mm -hmm. michael yeah greater income potential greater income potential for sure <laughs> absolutely you if you lose a client you can get another client Right. But in the W2 world, if you lose your job, it, uh, we know how long it takes to get another job, especially now. Mm -hmm. What else? Positives. Well, uh, I can add another one that is, you know, you actually get to choose your clients and the type of work you want to do. Yeah. Shalom was mentioning that. Absolutely. The type of clients. Yes. And the kind of work. One of the beautiful things about self-employment is that you can reinvent yourself. Oh, whole lot more easily than you can if you're a W-2. If you're a W-2 employee, you have a resume and that employer is risk averse. So they're going to look at that resume and say, oh, you've been there, done that. We're going to make you do that again. Whereas if you want to pivot your career field, you want to pivot your industry, you have to do a lot of gymnastics to, to, to minimize the risk of the employer. Very hard to do that. In self-employment, you come on to a networking call like this, and say, hey, everybody, this is what I do for a living. And they'll believe you <laughs> as long as you feel confident in it. You can much more easily reinvent yourself. No one's asking you for a resume. They just need to know that you have confidence in what you're able to deliver. And then you can deliver it and you and you can reinvent very, very easily. So thanks for that. Uh, anything else you can think of? Positives. Well, I, I would add one more, uh, Cher. How about uh, uh, you know a high level of control over yourself and your business? Yeah. Absolutely. You do. You have control over what you do. You have control over your schedule, um, how much, how little, the scope, the size of clients, the, all of it, all of it. Yes, you can. And you can keep reinventing yourself. And I happen to be a, a very good example. And as we go through our conversation today, I might actually bring myself up into the conversation because I've been self-employed for many years. And I like to say I keep adding lanes to my highway. <laughs> Right. And there are different highways you might have. It, it might be a sectoral highway or a or a, a certain kinds of offerings. But oftentimes the clients will continually ask you, hey, they'll, they'll ask me this. And I know Michael's self-employed, too. They'll say to us, hey, can you can you help me with? And what do we say, Michael? Sure. Yeah. Or if it makes sense, we say, sure. Now, if it doesn't make sense, we won't. We'll refer to another colleague. But if the rubber band can stretch okay. a little bit. Why not, right? We can be a bit of greater service to our clients. And so what will happen is we'll start adding practice areas. So it's just something to, to, to think about. So here are some of the few that I, you know, I put in. And we, again, we've talked about this a little bit, right? You can reinvent, flexible schedule, unlimited income, multiple, multiple streams of revenue. So it's not even just reinventing, but those lanes to the highway 
you can keep adding. And I, I recommend that when you, when you start, you start with one lane, right? So whatever this is, so Shalom is, is looking at being a virtual assistant. Well, it might be Shalom that as you're going into your business, another lane comes up naturally. Well, guess what? That's another revenue stream. And not only is that helpful just to diversify your portfolio, but it also helps you weather the economy. So for example, take someone like me, I, my, a lot of, some of you who know who I am, I'm in sort of the workforce world. Okay. So the kind of the hiring coachy job seeky kind of thing. So I keep my lanes. So I have a recruiting lane. I'm a recruiter. I'm also a career coach. I'm also a small business coach and an executive coach. And now I've actually added strategic planning for nonprofits. I mean, I do a bunch of things now. My point is that I can weather economic waves. So for, if employers are hiring a lot, great. If they're not hiring a lot, great. Then the job seekers need me. And I can sort of help people in different ways, regardless of economic conditions. So th be thinking about that, whatever practice you're going into, that is something that maybe you can have some flexibility with and always be thinking, hmm, is there another way to repurpose? Is there another way to innovate? Is there another service I can provide appropriately? You don't want to stress yourself too, too thin necessarily, but be available and open when a client says, hey, can you help me? If you feel like you can, you might be able to spin up a quick little practice area, do some research, dive in a little bit, see how it feels. If it's not right for you, that's fine. Find colleagues that you can refer the business to, but the multiple streams of income is important. And then pursue your passion. You know, for a lot of people who've been working for the three decades, right? Plus, um, you know, we'll, we'll get to a stage where it's like, oh, when I was 25, I had this passion for uh, 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 uh. And then all of a sudden you look 30 years down the road and it's dissipated. Why? Because those risk averse employers never let you, gave you a chance to do the thing you loved. They kept pigeonholing you into the things that you were capable of doing. Let me say that again. They didn't give you a chance to do what you loved. They kept pigeonholing you into things that you were just capable of doing. And just because you're capable doesn't mean you have passion around it. So you might have some latent passions from way back that could be spun up that where you can reinvent yourself now, fresh new you, so a new market, and no one's gonna question you because all you need to do is say, look, this is, this is my passion, this is where I'm launching, and people will give you a chance, much differently than they would if you were trying to change your W-2 career, okay? So let's talk about, and you know, Daniel was ask, asking about um, the difference that I was thinking between self-employment uh, self and, um, entrepreneurship, I'm just going to, I'm going to go over the a distinction of what I consider to be the difference between freelance work and small business. Okay, I'm not going to address entrepreneurship again. So here's, here's how my distinction around this. Um, I believe that if somebody is going to have, um, would like to have uh, some flexible income and not necessarily brand themselves around a particular thing, they may want to consider freelance work. So for example, maybe you have some meeting planning skills, but you have some bookkeeping skills and you have some writing skills and you have all of these different eclectic types of skills that you want to put out into the market and earn a little income here and a little bit there and a little bit under the radar, right? Or you're not, you don't need a website and you don't need to brand yourself and you're not trying to write, focus on a particular lane. You just want to have what a colleague of mine calls a casserole of work a little this, a little that, and a little the other. I would call you a freelancer, and that's a perfectly legitimate way to earn income. A little bit of this and that. And, and you'd call your friends and colleagues, say, hey, do you need any meeting planning help? Hey, do you need any bookkeeping? You could do that. A small business is a little the opposite of that. It is, in my mind, where you are staking a claim. You are committed to a brand. You have a business name and a website, and, you, and you're marketing yourself in a very specific way and you're you're networking and maybe have some thought leadership i mean right small business means to me means you're committing to something you're committing to either uh, one or more particular lanes of work or you're committing to an industry or both but you are staking a claim say this is what i do freelance doesn't really have that commitment you can kind of sort of toss things into the mix right so hopefully that makes sense so Let's talk about um, the kinds of services that you may want to offer. And this is not an exhaustive list. It's just kind of a, you know, a, 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 some, some, a few categories. So you could do short-term projects, right? You could offer yourself as sort of an outsourced person and, and somebody might say to you, hey, can you work on this project for three months, for six months? It has a defined scope of work. 
typically there's a project fee for the whole project and you know it won't take you 40 hours a week for six months or for three months but it's it's something that you would do for a finite period of time it might also be that you you go with monthly retained services so for example um let's say you are a um uh, a consultant uh, let's say you're a lobbyist actually that's a, that's a, a very a pretty classic one and i'm in dc if any of you are here in dc we have lots of lobbyists a lot of lobbyists have our monthly retainers and it may or may not surprise you to know i'm not speaking out of turn here because this is pretty industry standard these lobbyists will typically charge ready 10 to fifteen thousand dollars a month for one client 10 to 15k a month and for that amount they will say to the client let's say it's an association that they're doing lobbying for say hey I'm going to work on your issues. Of course, they're not working 40 hours a week, but they're going to work on those issues here and there. It's not a set amount, number of hours. It's just they're sort of available, okay? And there are a number of people who do monthly retained, and it's for a set fee, and you, you define the scope of work, and you're kind of available. Now, some people do put limits to the hours. Say, well, no more than 10 hours a month or whatever, but, but you, it's a regular steady stream of income because the em employer is paying you for this ongoing service. And with a monthly retainer, it's sort of assumed that they're going to need you for a long period of time. Very different than the short-term project, which they know is literally a finite thing. Monthly retain says, hey, we're going to need you on an ongoing basis. Maybe you do HR consulting services and they want you for three hours a week or whatever it is, or they need you on call to be able to call you and say, oh, we've got a, we've got a staffing issue here. We, we need your, your availability. That means they're, they're going to want you on a monthly retainer, probably for a very long period. It could be a year or two years, could be indefinite. Fractional consulting goes along, along with that. And fractional is a new concept. I, I mean, not brand new, but it's kind of really hit the market in the last I don't know, number of years. I believe it started in the financial world. Fractional basically means part-time. I don't, I don't just mean any old part-time job. I mean, somebody who would otherwise be at the C-suite. So you would say a fractional COO, fractional CFO, fractional CIO, fractional CMO. Somebody who would otherwise be an executive, like a chief marketing officer or chief financial officer, what have you, but they're offering their services on a part-time basis. So a fractional means, hey, I'm going to be a fractional CFO. You client are going to get me for two days a week. I'm going to be on your staff, like on your org chart. It's going to look like I'm a CFO, but I'm only there two days a week. So it's still a monthly retainer and they do strategic work, but there's a very finite scope. There isn't any other duties as assigned. It's just whatever the scope is. And that's the beautiful thing about fractional is that if you're not pulled into everything else, you're only there for the whatever the scope is and for those couple of days. And it doesn't have to be C-level necessarily, although that's normally what it is. Government contracting, um, not my world per se, although I know tangentially, you know, I, I play a little bit in that. Um, or some people call it GovCon in DC, of course, they're on every street corner. And that is an entirely different concept that we are not going to address today because it is a very complicated thing to do, to do, to work with the federal or any government agency, but certainly the federal government. Um, it's something you may want to explore solo, but I will, I will share with you that if you are going to pursue government contracting, your best, actually your only bet right now is that you would become a subcontractor under a prime. Okay. Now you can, I should say, it's not your only, you, you can work with the government directly, but if you do that um, and you're just, you're just, um, you, you sort of build a relationship with someone, they're going to have to, you're going to have to keep it under a certain price, uh, usually under $3,000, um, because anything above that, it's a contract and it's a, it's a large contract and you need to um, be on uh, typically what's called the GS schedule, whole thing. <laughs> Anyway, you're going to want to find a prime a prime contractor that you can sub underneath and do the work under them, and they'll upcharge you. But you'd want to find a prime. So that's that's as much as I'm going to touch on that. All I can say is more complicated than you think um, than than working directly with a business. E-commerce again, we're not going to talk about that today. That's not my specialty. But e-commerce retail, we all know and love it. All everybody who's competing with Amazon from the Etsy's and all the rest of it, right? A lot of folks that are getting involved in this certainly something you can pursue. And please know that when you're, if you are going to choose to do e-commerce, it's a very, very different type of marketing than if you're going to, to work with businesses. And so, um, in a minute, I'll have a slide that shows the three kinds of businesses you can have: B two B, which is business to business; B two C, which is business to consumer; and B two G, which is business to government. E-commerce is B2C. Your marketing is very different. It's typically online. You are dealing with the masses. It's very competitive. The marketing strategy is a whole different thing. 
If you're doing B2B, that's typically relationship building, right? It's one-to-one, -one, or maybe you, you show up in networking meetings or you do public speaking or what have you, but it's a very different, it's re really relationship building with another person. Whereas e-commerce B2C is, is typically a digital relationship with people. So social media is heavily involved in e-commerce, may or may not be as involved in, as much in the B2B world. And then multi-level marketing, we all know the famous Amway and Mary Kay and all of that. Those are legitimate businesses, okay? And some people really like to have that um, sort of, the, if you will, the mothership, right? Somebody who has the, uh, the established brand and you go out and you sell their products, the vitamins or whatever it is to friends, family, colleagues, and, and what have you. Okay. So now I want to get into the guts of this. So today, what we really wanted to focus on is how to repurpose your skills. So everyone on this call has been working for a long minute, right? You have developed, you have acquired a number of very powerful um, talents and gifts that can be repurposed, but it's not that you're going to repurpose everything. You're going to repurpose the things that are going to be um, that are going to relate to the problems that you want to help employers solve. But the first thing is we have to we have to do a little bit of a skills assessment. So I'm going to take you through my very famous exercise called passionativity. What I'd like everybody to do right now, if you can see this, I know the sorry the lines are kind of faint. I'd like you to grab a sheet of paper, and I'm just going to walk you through this. Okay, and um, depending on our time today, I think I think we'll have time to do a little bit of on the spot Tony Robbins coaching. <laughs> um, and I'd like you to just first do the four quadrants. And yes, there is a little, a little extra quadrant in the upper left. And I'd like you to label the lines as follows. High motivation at the top, low motivation at the bottom, high skill on the right, low skill on the left. Okay, just take a few seconds to do that. All right, and now I'm gonna take you through each of these quadrants. So in the upper right, we have high engagement. So high engagement are skills that you are a rock star at. You've always been a rock star. These are things that are in your wheelhouse. The interesting thing about this box is that it's not only skills that you're great at, it's skills that you love to do. You give discretionary effort. Wild horses can't drag you away. You are all over <laughs> this work. This is going to become the box that we use to help repurpose your skills. But I'm going to get there in a minute. Just hold on. This, But that's a very important box. The second box is stop gap work, high skill, low motivation. These are skills that you have developed over the years. You are absolutely capable, competent. Everybody knows it, but truth be told, you tolerate this work. Now here's the thing in a W2 situation. And I do this because I'm a regular career coach as well. Yeah. We'll focus on our high engagement skills, but at the end of the day, we all know that that other duties as a sign which is going to probably be in this lower right box, that's going to come into play. And you don't have any control over that because that employer, you're theirs, right? And they tell you what to do and you have a supervisor and they've got business needs and that's fine. But you sort of have to, you know, be patient around that. But when you're self-employed, you can focus on the high engagement skills and not focus on your stop gap. So what Shalom was saying earlier, or I think it was Michael actually, you know, you can pick your, the work you want to do. You don't have to lean into your stopgap work. You can lean into your high engagement. In addition, in the upper left, there's professional development. So professional development, I'm breaking this down into two separate boxes, want to and should. These are areas of growth for you. It, these are areas, and by the way, in case you're also thinking about W2 work, this exercise is multi-purpose, but today we're just using it for self-employment. But this is, these are areas that you could lean into if you wanted to add lanes to your highway. And here are the two areas, want to and should. Want to are actually the things you want to do more of. So, you know, for example, maybe you're an HR consultant and you really want to learn how to be an executive coach. Okay, great. That's something that might be natural for an HR person maybe to say. And so they're going to want to lean in. Maybe they want to get a certificate or whatever, but it's, a, it's an area of growth. But the should is sort of the have to. Now, thankfully, because, you know, when you're self-employed, you don't necessarily have to take on the have to's, <laughs> but it might be that in some part of your work, because you're small and because you don't going to kind of hire people yet, and you don't, you just sort of have to be a little scrappy. There might be some skills that you need to develop in order to have your business be successful. So you want to think about that. And then finally, disengagement, low skill, low motivation. These are areas that completely drain you. They are opposite of your personality. They are opposite of the high engagement box. Ain't your jam at all. 
Um, if not only are you, if a client asks you to do this, not only are you going to say, no, thank you, you're going to probably pa immediately pass it off to somebody else who does do that work very well. Okay. So because we actually have a little bit of time, I think we can, we can, we can sit here for just a minute. I'd like for each of you to just take a few minutes and I want you to work on this exercise for just a bit. But I, what I really want you to do just for the sake of time is mostly focus on the high engagement box. So again, what you're going to do here, you can fill out as much of it as you can. I'm going to give you a few minutes, but really focus on high engagement. These are skills. Again, you're highly skilled. You're highly motivated to do but I want you to focus on a certain kind of skill. This is important, I want everybody to listen up. I'm looking for your hard skills, not your soft skills. What do I mean by that? I'm looking for what you do, not how you do it. So for example, here's what you would, the kinds of things you would say. You might say financial analysis, research, writing, um, customer service, sales, sales uh, things like that, strategic planning, things like that. What I'm not looking for you to say, is I'm strategic or I'm great with people or I'm organized or detailed or analytical, none of that. Because that's very hard to repurpose. Those are soft skills. You, what makes this repurposable is the fact that it's a hard skill. It's a, it's a functional thing that you do, okay? So I want you to just take a few minutes and fill that out, okay? Again, with your hard skills, particularly just focus on high engagement. If you want to fill out the other ones, that's fine. When we're done, if you would like to be, um, in the hot seat, I'm happy to do a little bit of spot coaching and just help you quickly unpack what you've written. And then we're going to go on to some other slides and I'm going to give you more context around how to maybe purpose, repurpose that into self-employment. Okay. So I'll stop share and let you work for a few minutes and then we'll see if anybody wants to be called out and get a little bit of spot coaching. But Shira, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Problem solving is soft, right? That That's is soft. Fine. That is soft. I just yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for that. Yep. Another 30 seconds or so.
righty. All right, who would like to get a little bit of informal coaching here and want to share with me your, your exit? Greg, brave Greg. Okay, so <laughs> did you fill all four out or just the, one, the, the upper right? I filled out two. Okay, which ones? The high engagement and the low engagement all to the, the right. The, the, the bottom right? Okay, yeah. bottom, upper right, great. Back, back right and bottom right. Okay, so what I'd like you to do to help me out, and I'm going to take a couple notes. Okay. Um, I'd like you to, first of all, share with me, without any explanation yet, just what you have on paper. Uh, first, list out the upper right. What do you have there? I have um, uh, uh, making sure books are clean, accounting books. Uh-huh. Um, setting up... Um, setting up people's uh, books when they're starting accounting system, mm -hmm. doing reconciliations, finding mistakes, business analysis and forecasting. Also, um, reading or determining people's communication styles. So that's the high engagement yeah. stuff is really interesting stuff. Great. Okay. And the bottom right? Where to bottom high right. High skill, low motivation. Yeah, um, actually, uh, said um, tax forms, completing tax forms, mm -hmm. HR record keeping. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are the those. Are those the are the those are the two. So yeah. very so very interesting. So I don't I don't remember your background. Can you just give me just a I mean thumbnail of a thumbnail of like two lines of what your career has been to date? Yeah, I spent most of my life in uh, analytical work. I was a regulatory analyst for a while. Yeah. And then I went into corporate finance for several years. Yeah. Um, yeah. A senior financial analyst, I did a finance manager role. Yeah. And um, then after that, I switched into education and I um, I was like a, a implement project implementation manager. Got it, okay. But you've never been an accountant, right? Or a CFO, that kind of thing. But you've had these transferable skills is what it sounds like. Yes. Yeah. It's just interesting how you how you framed it about keeping the books clean and setting up systems and such and so forth. So on the one hand, um, you know, I, I would imagine that some bookkeeping might, you know, come into play in the work that you do. But what what's really coming up for me are um, small businesses who don't have a CFO, Mm -hmm. um, and who don't even have an accountant necessarily, but they want somebody who is going to um, be that person to set systems up and make sure the operations are there and the infrastructure is there and and sort of things are kind of in place, but also need somebody who's going to do um, some forecasting, right? Because there yeah. are a lot of small companies. And, just, and, and by the way, I'm not just speaking to Greg right now, I'm speaking to everybody. There are a lot of small companies who need what would otherwise be the skills of a full-time person, but they're too small to either afford one or just even have the capacity for it. They don't have a need for it. A full-time CFO, a full-time whatever. So they outsource, they outsource, they outsource. So Greg, something you may want to consider um, is, you know, do you, to on whatever um, uh, uh, sort of scale you want to think of it, do you want to actually lean into some actual bookkeeping or not? Or do you want to kind of lean more into, again, setting up infrastructures, making sure that their system works well, doing some of that forecasting, CFO-esque kind of work. This right. Sense, but really focusing in on the small business community because that's the community that will likely need those kinds of services. Does that make sense? Have you thought about yeah. that at all? I haven't thought about it much. I mean, I, the, bookkeeping, keep, the bookkeeping piece, yes, but not the other piece. Yeah, because I it sounds just just the two seconds you just shared this, right? Obviously, we'd have to have a longer coaching conversation to explore it more. But just at a high level, mm -hmm. my quick take would be thinking about broadening your services because you didn't just say, oh, I like to just do bank racks. Talking about the systems, you're talking about forecasting, you're thinking about going a little bit beyond just the bookkeeping. Just yep. as, as, as I like to say, a difference between counting the beans and growing the beans, right? right. So you're, not, you're not just a bean counter. You right. can help forecast right where the beans are going to grow. So yep. just, I just want to just take a, a minute to give you a flavor of what that could sound like. Does that, does that resonate? Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. Good, mm -hmm. good, good. All right. One more person. And then we're going to go on and I'm, I'm going to show you kind of all other ways of how this shows up. Who else would like to jump in now that you see how this goes? 
I can call on you. <laughs> Kathy, I'm going to call on you because you were the first person, one of the first people to show up today. I knew you were going to call on me. Of course. <laughs> um, well, you know what? I did mine a tiny bit different just because I already know what I'm I want to do with my business. I'm just, like I said, overwhelmed with it. Um, okay. So I, it was funny that I forgot the man that just spoke his name, Greg. Um, mm -hmm. But when he said, I wrote down what he said, cause I hate that stuff. Um, oh, and <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a marketing and, and sales type of person. Although I actually really, and I wrote this, I wrote like, and good at, um, mm -hmm. and at meeting planning, um, marketing, visual, creative stuff. Um, I do like setting up infrastructures. So I wrote that down, but I had also written down things I don't like. So that was kind of my top um, right corner. And then on the bottom right corner, the things I don't like, even though I'm in sales, I don't really, I've never really loved sales, it, but it, you know, it's a necessary part of it. Um, yeah. And um, I'm definitely more of a marketing person than a sales person, but it's part of the thing um, anyway, but, but then um, it was interesting because all the things that you, um, Greg, I believe was saying regarding accounting bills, taxes, expenses, bookkeeping. Bottom I hate line. it all. I hate Bottom all that. Of course, stuff. Cause you're a comms yeah. person. Most of us comms people don't like that stuff that Greg likes, right? Right. Exactly. So it kind of, um, it was interesting cause I'd never really thought about those. So that was very helpful for, for me Good. because they are the things that are part of some of the contrast between those two things. And of course there's a lot more are um, the things I don't like are a lot of the things that are, have been holding me back and keeping me stuck. Yeah. Um, yeah. For in sure, moving for sure. forward. And, and that's, and that's why this exercise is really helpful no matter where you are in your, in your business or career journey for for that matter, but in your business journey, because you can, it helps to sift and sort yeah. your likes and your capabilities. And most okay. people kind of have that all jumbled up, but really take the time to sift and sort it. And you'll be surprised at what you see, because what you're going to see are themes. If you really look at it. Now you could obviously work with a person like me, but you, if you just, just analyze it, you, you step back and go, huh, there's, there's something connected here. Right. And yeah. so for example, and you, with you, um, and I would, you know, if we had more time, I'd be asking you more about your marketing. Well, what part of marketing are you doing? Are you more on the digital side, more market research? Like, I mean, you know, there's a huge continuum. Are you more Marcom? Are you, but thinking about the kinds of skills you want to lean into, then connecting that with who would most benefit from your service and then who wants to pay for that service and under okay. what conditions do they want to pay for that service because just some because somebody needs what you have doesn't mean they want to invest in what you have okay okay so if you think about like somebody who wants to lose 20 pounds they might say it they might say it until the doctor says um if you don't lose 20 pounds or they want to get into the wedding dress or they want to right all of a sudden call Jenny Craig so like yeah. the urgency seriously the urgency can change things for people um, or George, the size of the company or the sector there. I mean, there's so many variables here, but you got to first start with your lane. You got to first start with what you want to offer and where you want to lean in. And then you look at the surrounding market and say, okay, well, who needs it? And under what conditions? That's why this is a process. Okay. And we're, this is just the first step. Great. Well, thank you both for. Yeah. For thank you. Yeah, for sure. So I'm going to go back here and. Um, oops. We're going to give you an example. Okay. So it's a couple of you have chimed in. So here, here's just the example that I put up here. So let's say that this was what somebody put in project man and high motivation and high engagement, project management, group facilitation, cross-functional team building, conflict management, just sort of an eclectic mix of things, but notice what they put in the, or what we put in the high skill low motivation, financial management, data, technology report. High motivation, high skill, low skill training, and then the should budget management. I want you to see why I did it this way. Because if you actually, I want to get ask you guys to do the analysis. What do you think is the theme in the upper right corner versus in the lower right corner? I'm going to put the low skill here. What do you think are the themes here? What do you think the person 
I, I made this person up, right? So what do you think this person would want to lean in or how would you maybe even describe this person's personality? What are you, what are you reading into here? Outside program management or project management, uh, management, mm -hmm. uh, yep. only because I used to, to work in those capacities. <laughs> right. So it looks, so this looks familiar to you. And yeah. how might you, what, uh, what might be an aspect of this person's personality that they want to lean into? Definitely good, uh, good people skills, That's good it. communication. That's it. That's you know, a lot it. of stuff, stuff uh, skills. E exactly. Exactly. The soft skills, the relational skills. Contrast that with the bottom right. What literally contrast that for me? Uh, it's a shimi. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, so that's really interesting because I actually moved from the upper right corner into the the, the bottom right corner, uh, which is where more of my passion is. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting for me. Um, the contrast here would be. I don't know if I want to say more tangible skills. Yeah. On the bottom. Tactical. I would also say analytical, more, yes. more heady, more thinking skills rather than relational skills. And it's not to say that they're mutually exclusive because of course you'd use both and both, but there's a lean, right? right? Somebody who's more, who wants to lean in more toward their relational skills might put the upper right or more toward the analytical might be more in the bottom right. And this is going to matter in just a minute, which also, if you think, look at the others, the upper left, a relational person might be interested more in learning how to be a better trainer, but also might kind of say, oh, budget management, <laughs> I guess they may not like that too much. Same thing, HR compliance, maybe the HR kind of side is the training, but not so much on the compliance and the, right. I'm that way actually, because I, I kind of play with HR people often, but I'm not on the process side of the house. Like don't hire me to do your payroll or your benefits or your employment law, but but hire me if you want to do work with people, like hiring them or engaging them or generations or right people stuff. Does this make sense? So your personality is actually going to show up if you do this authentically in terms of where you, what you put where. Okay. So I'm going to give you an, a very, very important formula that you can use or a concept here to help you to repurpose those skills particularly your upper right, your high engagement skills into something that is a meaningful business. And Kathy, I want you especially to lean into this one, okay? And here's what I call it. The difference between what I call your ing, and it sounds funny, but it'll make sense in a second. Your ing skill. So your ing is a skill that you enjoy. For example, writing or event plan ing or marketing, okay, an ing. The er is the small business version of that skill. So writer. Event planner, event planner, marketer, okay, accountant, those kinds of things, where you are focusing in on turning that skill into a profession, into a business. It's a very, very important distinction. So if you go back to that other person, um, project management, I believe, was one of the ing skills. It's a skill, project management, which is different than being a project manager. That's a PMP. That's a whole thing, right? So if somebody wanted to turn that into a business, they'd be a project management consultant. Does that make sense? And they would lean into that as opposed to someone who just knows how to do project management. And then, yeah, it's a skill that they have and they might want to use it within their consulting business, but they don't want to be called themselves a project manager. Okay. It's really, really helpful because when you have amassed the, the 30,000 skills over the 30 years you've been working and, and the employers have been pigeonholing you here, there, and wherever, it's good to take a breath, sift and sort these skills, put your skills into high engagement and say, huh, that thing right there, that one, that one, that one right there, that ing skill. Oh my gosh. I love doing that so much that I could see myself doing it full time. And I'm going to give you a, a real example. So years ago I was, and I mentioned that I do small business coaching. So years ago I was coaching a woman named Jacqueline and funny enough, she was coming to me for regular career coaching. She thought <laughs> she was a regular W2 job. She came to me as a nonprofit executive, nonprofit CEO. And we did the passionativity and she put a bunch of things in her high engagement, maybe seven, eight things. And they sounded like board relations and strategic planning, you know, nonprofit executive kinds of things. And in there <clears throat> was event planning. And so I, there was a whole list, right? And I said, okay, Jackie, I said, I want you to put this ing or filter 
on that box? Are there any skills, any ing skills that pop off the page to you where you're like, I love this work. I absolutely could see myself doing it full time. And I was just thinking maybe just recareering her into another W2 job. So she goes, I said, is there anything that pops off the page? She goes, yes. She like leans into the table and she goes, donor event planning. I said, really? She goes, no, no, you don't understand. I am like, she goes, the best donor event planner. I am so good. She said, I've got other nonprofit executive colleagues. They call me all the time for me to help them with their donor events. We laugh, we cry, we got kids, we got this, we got that. I mean, she was just in love with this. I said, Jackie, look at the passion you've got here. I said, do you think you could actually see yourself doing this as a business? She goes, mm -hmm. humanimpactevents.com was born. We pivoted and we just start talking to her about small business, right? That's how Ing and Er works. Where do you have a passion around one of your Ing skills or more than one? You can put things together or you can think about different Ing skills and different lanes, and right? But where do you have a passion where you want to actually flesh it out into something that is a real business. The next piece of this, so ing and ill, ing and er are the skills, but then there's the community, okay? And that's the industry, mission, or sector whose business problems you know well. Now, this is worthy of a few minutes of a conversation. Because you've been working, as long as you've been working, you probably have some industry expertise. Now, even if you've been with five different industries, you still high likely have some industry expertise. It is very possible, and may I say even recommended, that when you repurpose yourself into an ER, right, into a business, that you strongly consider tapping the industry that maybe you most recently came from, although it doesn't have to be recent, but an industry you know well, where you know their business problems, you know the climate, you probably have contacts there where you can more easily spin up your business. Rather than starting from scratch into a whole new community you've never been with, go tap the people who know you, like you, and trust you. Now I'll take myself and I'll take Michael, Michael Butera, who um, I, some of you saw when we got on the call. So he's one of our volunteers here at Boomerworks. And uh, Michael has, has, publicly said that he acknowledged that I helped him small business coaching to help him trans. He actually trans transferred from W2 to self-employment. So he and I happen, and this is how we know each other, actually. He, he and I happen to have a very strong community focus. We're both from the association community. We both, he was, was a CEO. I've been consulting, but we know them people. Okay. Them is our people. And so he it made perfect sense for Michael when he left his umpteen years of working as an association executive immediately to go right back to that community and go, hey, I can consult for you. Because why? He knows their business challenges. He knows the market. He knows the people. He's a trusted colleague of those people. So he created a business called Association Activision. And let me tell you, it's flourishing. This man is busier than one on paper hanger. I'm always glad that he's able to join us in MoveWorks. He's a busy guy, right? Because he has a reputation already. Now, you may or may not have a, a deep reputation, but likely you know some people. So I want you to strongly consider when you're starting out to start within that fish pond, if you will, okay? Because you know those fish. Then it's a little bit easier to then expand. And I'll take myself again for just as an example. When I started out, I also, I had, I had, I had done recruiting for associations as a, um, I wasn't quite self-employed. I worked for an agency. But when I actually launched my own business, um, in 2011, I, I went back to that association community. And of course, some of my initial clients were from that community. It make perfect sense. But once I started doing work, what happened? This association person referred their friend, referred their next door neighbor, referred their colleague from a previous job, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, I'm start getting cross-sectoral work off of that association fish pond. Does that make sense? So it's very likely that you're going to start entering other sectors from the one sector because of referrals. If you do good work, people will want to refer you to their friends and colleagues and coworkers and so forth. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So next thing, let's talk about how to actually transfer this, like, like put it all together. So you've got the ing skills that you enjoy, the high engagement. You've got looking at your ERs. 
you've got your community, but also you may want to put in here passions and hobbies. So for those of you, I'm going to tell another quick story. Um, for those of you who may remember in the food world, uh, there was a woman named Paula Dean. Um, and she, for a while, um, she was a Food Network star. Okay. And she had a, a line, not only was she on TV, she had restaurants and all these different things. Well, her story came out of the call it a hobby was actually a necessary hobby. So many years ago, the story goes is that she was unfortunately an agoraphobe. She, she was scared to leave the house. And so she was a single mom and she had two, two teenage sons and they had to eat and she knew how to cook. And it turns out that there was a business of, of an office complex near her house and so she sent her boys out to, to go sell sandwiches to the office workers one day. And her food was so good, it took on, took off. She started a business and one thing led to another. She really, really started a business. Of course, she then got to go out of the house, <laughs> felt confident, and she started a restaurant. And then years later, she ended up on the Food Network, okay? Now that started out of, not of necessity, but it may be that you have a hobby. You're a photographer. You like gardening. You like... Um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, organizing, you know, organizing closets. I don't know, whatever it is. You like working with elder care. I know a, a colleague of mine many years ago, she was a colleague, she was a recruiter and she decided to start a business um, helping uh, children of elderly people to help the elderly person with their bills and their paperwork and all of this. She decided to do an elder care business. Like there are so many things you could do, but it might be, it might come out of a passion or a hobby and that's perfectly legitimate to do. And then the, then you take all of those things together and you say, well, what can be monetized? What is realistic? So I'm going to give you a couple little examples here. So we take the project management as an ing skill, which of course means project manager. Maybe the community that you came from is government contracting. Might make sense. So you do outsource project management with government contractors. Pretty straightforward. Accounting or budgeting. Greg, right? <laughs> That's the er is the bookkeeper. And maybe your passion is elderly, right, people. So maybe you provide bookkeeping services for nursing homes. You see how this works? You really just think about it logically, what you love to do, who you love to do it for. Could there be a market for your services? That's the straightforward way of doing it. So now let's go and let's think about this a little bit more from a, from a business model perspective. And I'm just going to share with you again, as I mentioned earlier, the three different types of businesses that you could have. B2C, business to consumer, which typically means when you're marketing, you're targeting a demographic. You're targeting 50 plus people. You're targeting younger people. You're targeting people in a certain geography. You're targeting people who have a certain kind of lifestyle, whatever it is, but it's typically a demographic of people that you're going after. B2B, you're often targeting an industry. You want to sell services to nonprofits. You want to sell services to the to uh, to uh, the financial services sector, to the commercial real estate sector, whatever it is, but you're generally targeting an industry. Not that you have to stay with that industry, but you're normally there's a, often there's a focus. And then B2G, again, is business to government. You're often targeting a sector, the defense sector or um, the healthcare. You know, you want to work with CMS or HHS or what have you, right? And you're typically offering a service to them. Now, here are the questions that you want to be asking. These are the kind of the real sort of business modeling kind of questions. First of all, who is your target market? Who isn't? Be defined about that. You're not trying to be all things to all people. You're not trying to say, oh, I've got a widget. Oh, I've got a service. Let me just help everybody. People like to know that you're focused on them because people like to hire specialists, not generalists. So you need to have a, a market that makes sense. Again, you can expand your market. You absolutely can. But people like to know that you are their focus, that they are, they are your focus rather. And so again, whether it's a demographic, whether it's a sector, it could be a broader sector, a more niche sector. And by the way, people think, oh, I should do all these things. The more niche, the better, honestly, because when you become an expert in something and people know that you're that person for them, you actually get can get a whole lot more work because then you then because you're defining a scope for yourself that maybe other that maybe a road less traveled maybe other people don't go there it's a specialized kind of a thing uh, I'll give you an example in my world with uh, with with um, with uh, Michael okay in the association world well oftentimes associations don't hire salespeople 
Occasionally they do, but they usually don't. They're very small and they don't really know what to do exactly with a salesperson. And yet they have conferences that need to, the sponsorships that need to be sold at conferences and maybe advertisers for their publications. They need to sell membership because they have member dues. Well, there are these occasional consultants out there that that's what they do. They are niche. They do sales for associations. They will sell membership or sponsorships or those kinds of things. They don't sell SaaS software. They don't sell financial service. They sell to the association world. They're niche and very targeted. And they're known in our community as, oh, go to so-and-so. There's a guy named Scott that Michael and I both know. All I have to do is say Scott. And a lot of people know who I'm talking about in that community because that's the guy who often does these kinds of things. So you can develop a reputation within a niche market if you go niche. Okay? You don't have to, but it's nice to think about that. Number two, what are the urgent problems they will want to pay you to help them solve? And I addressed this a little bit ago, but this is worth repeating. It's worth repeating. People typically pay for people to solve urgent problems not just long-term problems. I'm not saying it, it has to be an urgent problem that you're solving, but it's a shorter, as we say, a shorter sales cycle. The sales cycle is how long it takes for a client to close, uh, to, to closing meaning to, to, to make a decision. It's typically a shorter sales cycle when the problem is urgent. When the problem is not urgent, it's not that you can't sell it, but it might take a long time. It could take months to get the person to make a decision or the company to make a decision. But the second piece of that is, again, will they want to pay you? It's not just a matter of need to, it's want to. A lot of technology companies fall into this trap. So you have a, an engineer who likes to play with toys and they come up with this cool widget gidget thing. And they're like, oh my gosh, everybody's gonna love this. But they just love the idea of this toy. But they haven't necessarily done market research. They don't necessarily know that there's a market for it. They think, oh, this is all that slices bread. It does all these things. But if people don't need the bread sliced, it's not going to be a good market, right? So you have to think about products and services that people will want to invest in. Now, the pricing is a different story, but they they have to want to pay for it, not just need to, want to. And then which products or services will best serve their needs, right? Not just the things that you want to offer, which is important, but also... What do they actually need? What's going to really solve those problems well? And then how will you market to prospective customers? All right? Are you going to just do relationship building one-on-one? -on -one? Are you going to show up at networking meetings? Are you going to do some public speaking? Are you going to do some thought leadership? If you're B2C, are you going to do a lot of digital marketing? All kinds of ways. Are you going to, are going to use what we call alliance partners? Alliance partners are a wonderful way to expand your business. An alliance partner is somebody who kind of Venn diagrams with your business. Um, actually, Michael and I would be considered um, alliance partners in that we serve, this, in this case, we serve the same community and we do complementary work to each other, but we don't do the same work. We overlap in one little area, but for most part, we don't. But we might hear a business that we could refer to the other person because we're in the same community. Or I'll give you another, another way that that's shown up for me. So for a long time, um, I was more just a career coach. I didn't really do any um, executive coaching. I do a little bit of executive coaching now. But I have a colleague, an alliance partner, a guy named Bill Pullen. And Bill has been an executive coach for years and years and years and years. That's all he does. That's his lane. He's like five guys. That's what Bill does. He's an executive coach. And he knew that I was a career coach. And so he started referring career coaching clients. Why was that a good alliance partner? Because as an executive coach, he was talking to people who were in leadership roles, right? And every once in a while, one of those people would say, hey, Bill, I actually want to go look for a new job. He's not a career coach. He doesn't write resumes. He doesn't write like LinkedIn profiles. He knew that I did that. So it was a natural referral source because he was talking to the same clients that I would, but he was talking to them in a, in a context where he was likely to hear about a referral for me. Or really, if it's a referral for them, it has nothing to do with me. It's, he wanted to be a solution to his client's problems. And that's the thing that you need to think about with alliance partnerships. It's not about you. In fact, none of this is about you. This is all about helping people. Let's get that very clear. We are here to serve. We are here to serve people. Making money is a nice addition to this, but that's not why we're here. We're here to serve. And so when you think about alliance partners, it's a great way to serve your clients. 
Because if you have somebody who does something that's complementary to you that you don't do, or maybe you don't have really an expertise in, you can refer to them, right? I do that all the time. I got people, I got consultants coming out my ears. When my client says, hey, Shira, do you know of anybody who? I'm like, oh, call Dave. Oh, call Susie. Oh, call, 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 call. And they're doing that with me too. We're helping each other to serve our clients. So be thinking about how do you want to market? And alliance partners are a wonderful way to do that. And then how much will you charge? Which is a whole other conversation. <laughs> and, and part of that has to do with obviously what the market bears and what your region bears and what your sector bears. But it also has to do with the way that you're scoping the project. So again, are you doing a project, a, a defined scope of work? Are you doing a monthly retainer? Or are you doing an hourly fee, right? And different kinds of things different need different kinds of pricing strategies. So for example, when I do career coaching or small business coaching, I know my market. I do hourly. It makes perfect sense. Why would somebody pay me a retainer to do coaching? They wouldn't. You, I, they pay on an hourly. When I do a recruiting assignment for an organization, they pay a percentage of salary. When I do a strategic plan or when I do some other kind of, uh, you know, project project, they pay a project fee, you know, X dollars for the scope of work. But it all depends on the kind of work that you're offering, the kind of product or the kind of services, which means you need to do some market research. And I've over done that over the years. I have colleagues, trusted colleagues who help me with this. First time I ever did a speaking engagement. I had a colleague, my first paid speaking engagement was 2005. And I had a colleague named Sharon, Sharon Armstrong. And I'm like, Sharon, I know you're in that world. Can you, what do I charge? And she's like, well, let me tell you, there's a difference between a trainer rate and a keynote rate. Nah, 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 nah. And she's like teaching me. Okay, great. She helped me. And then years later, somebody else helped me with another low. We got to help each other with this. So sometimes you need to go to other consultants and ask them, what do you charge and how do you do it? Sometimes you need to go to your prospective clients and say, hey, um, do you use anybody who's wants who offers something that I do? How do you do? How do you pay for it? What's the rate? What do you typically charge? Under what conditions? What do you have an appetite for? You got you need to have some trusted relationships in your network so that people can share with you their own sort of mentoring moments around how to scope out your business. But again, they need to be doing something similar enough to you to help you. Or again, it's a prospective client people who maybe you have a trusted relationship with who would be willing to give you a little bit of, of behind the scenes of it. Yeah, when I work with these financial consultants, Greg, this is typically what I pay, right? And they kind of give you a little bit of intel. You have to start doing the market research to understand what the market will bear. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example. We're going to call this guy Pat, right? So Pat has a coaching service. Okay. So who is Pat's target market? So he's decided that he's going to target senior leaders in small accounting firms. And I want you to see what we did here. So Pat wants to be a coach, which is his lane, which is his er, and his community is small accounting firms. He wants to really kind of niche in to that sector. So what urgent problems will customers want to pay Pat to help them solve? Well, specifically, he wants to help staff, particularly early career staff, manage stress during tax season. Yeah, guess what? Them people, they are stressed out during tax season, right? And he knows that. So he wants to have this niche. Now, I'm not saying you have to go this when you're all thinking about this. You don't have to necessarily go to this niche, but I want you to see what's possible here. There's a way to do this where you can kind of zone in. So which products or services will best serve their needs? Well, specifically executive coaching and stress management workshop, workshops. You see how we got here? Coaching, counting, tax season, Here's the services. How will Pat market to customers? Well, he's going to get involved in the local chapter of the Maryland Association of CPAs. And yes, there is an association for everything. I don't know if anybody knows that here. Michael's probably laughing because we all say this all the time. There truly is. <laughs> and there are associations for all kinds of professions and all kinds of industries. And so one of the ways that you can market your own business is to show up at the local chapter of, which there often is a local chapter of something in your neighborhood, particularly for, if you're in a large city, um, where you can network with your decision makers. And so who are his decision makers? CPAs, who are for accounting firms. And he's going to network with them. And he's going to show up and he's going to say, hey, you got stressed out staff? <laughs> well, I'm here to help. Make sense? 
he's also going to do some blogging about stress management techniques in accounting firms. So he's going to get on LinkedIn and he's going to write some interesting articles about stress management during tax season and da, 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 da. And he's going to get some education out there into the market. Okay. And we come up with a cool name for him. Count on coaching. Cute, right? Right. Okay. This is a total fictitious person, but I want you to see how this works. Now, obviously there's a lot more detail around this, but in terms of framing up your business, I wanted you to see there's a very straightforward way you can do it. You don't have to be quite as niche. And in fact, I will say this to you. You don't need to necessarily focus on a community. You don't necessarily need to do that. But what I would suggest, if you are going to focus on your lane or your er, okay, that your er, your lane, your service, your product in and of itself is a little bit niche. So Kathy, it's not a matter of you saying, I do marketing, event planning, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. a little bit more niche than that. You know, maybe I'm making this up, right? So maybe you, um, you know, we're focusing on social media strategy, or maybe you're focusing more on, um, you know, some part of, of, of Marcom or whatever, but you're, you're, you're getting a little, or, or maybe it's in a certain, for certain kinds of products or services or whatever. You just have to define it is the point define it. We've actually here on Boomerworks, um, for those of you who are new to us, we have been having these monthly educational programs since uh, April of 2020. And we've offered all kinds of trainings and all kinds of topics. And uh, earlier this year, we had a couple of social media consultants. Notice what I just said. They are social media consultants. They're not just marketing consultants, they're social media consultants. They are specific in that lane and they get business in that lane. Now you can have a broader, right, Kathy, you can do, but understand you're now competing with a lot of people who also have these broad lanes. You've got to have a distinguisher. You have to have what's called a UVP, a unique value proposition, something that makes you distinct in your market, something that makes you distinct in your market, a soup, maybe it's a superpower you have, a way that you do something, a certain skill that you have that's very unique. Or again, it, or what makes you unique is the, the clients that you serve or something about what you do that's like other people generally don't do this. Some people do, but you want to have something that's kind of kind of niche, all right? And then we have, you know, it's email, right? Pat, oh, oh, this is important. Please, 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 please. <laughs> when you're starting your business, even if you don't have a formal website yet and don't you don't have all that, please get a business URL. So pat at countdowncoaching.com, not countdowncoaching at gmail.com or pat at gmail.com. No, don't use Gmail for this. It's too personal. It's not professional. Get a, a legit business um, uh, email address, okay? All right, so how are we going to, um, you know, how are we gonna do this? So what are so what are some of the branding tools that you're needed? And this is, again, we're at very high level today, right? We could go deep on any of these things. So the first thing, um, is host getting hosting a URL. So for those of you who have not done this before, which is probably most people here, um, there the first thing you need to do once you figure out what your your business model is and your um, and you get your name, you do need to go. You want to go get a URL. You want to get a, a web address. So countoncoaching.com. Okay, um, that is different than hosting your website. It's two different things. Let me really be clear about that. So when you get a web address, countoncoaching.com, and you, GoDaddy and Bluehost are two co uh, common ones. I use GoDaddy. All you're doing is buying the rights to that URL. It's very inexpensive. In fact, a lot of times when you first start, they charge you a buck or 10 or whatever. It's not, it's not, it's not expensive to get a URL. It wasn't expensive for me to get purposefulhire.com, which is the name of my company. Website hosting is different. I mean, someone's there, there on the back end with their server hosting your website. No, that's not terribly expensive, but it's not hosting a URL. So when you when you do when you get a get someone to host your website, yeah, you could be paying thirty bucks a month or more or less, right? Depending on on who's doing it. But the other thing about this is actually creating the website itself. Now, how do you create the website? Thankfully, no longer do you need a website designer. And I'm so sorry for the website designers out there because their business has been disrupted because of these things called website builders. So GoDaddy has one, Wix, Weebly, Squarespace. There are others I'm sure that are out there now. Gosh, AI is doing it. Just 
click a button, you know, to get your website built. That's actually not expensive at all. In fact, a lot of these are, they're just free. You to actually do the, to do build the website, you can actually do it for free. What they're paying, what you're paying for is the website hosting. So, you know, GoDaddy has a website hosting. Okay. And that's what you'd see. You'd create the, create this, the page and, you know, on their, on their site, you get them to host it. But of course you also need the URL. And again, the whole thing is going to probably cost you maybe 30, 40 bucks a month. When you're doing your website, you don't need anything complicated. Trust me on this. First of all, people don't want complicated anymore. Anyway, everybody scans and they're mobile and they just want to scroll down a nice, clean, compelling one page. Look at what I wrote here. What's the underscore? Customer centric. What do I mean by that? I actually mean the messaging. And Kathy, you will, sorry to keep picking on you. Um, you will appreciate this. Um, when, and this is a whole other thing, and I write websites and I do all this stuff. And Kathy, I don't know, maybe you do too. Um, here's what you do not want your website to sound like. Don't do this. Don't say on your website, well, hi, everybody. I do this and I do that. And here's my solutions and here's my offerings and here's my services. No, no, no. You want to walk a mile in your client's shoes. You want to be solving their problems. You want to read their mail. You want to have an opener and some language, hopefully quippy copy, but some language that speaks to the fact that you know their problems. So for example, I just, 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 just um, did a website for somebody who's a fractional COO. And we were working on his branding and he's the, you know, COO, right? So he, he helps people in all kinds of ways. Well, he helps small business owners. Why? Because small business owners don't need a full-time COO. They need a fractional CEO part time. And when he was doing that, when we were thinking about the branding, we had to say, well, what are the pain points that he really helps his employer solve or he helps his clients solve? And the one that we decided to focus in on is the fact that um, he wants to, the, one of the problems that his clients face is that they're two in the weeds. These are founders of small businesses and they're very much in the detail and they don't see in the cloud. They don't see, they don't have a, any strategic vision. And what my client wants to do is help them with strategic visioning. So the, so the, so the opening tagline, the opening line that we came up with is growth doesn't have to be a never ending grind. It's speaking to the client's problem. You're saying to that client, you're, you want to grow but you're in the grind, you're in the detail, you're in the minutia. And then we had copy that was around that. Say, oh, get out of the weeds, start seeing into the forest. My client can help you do that. But the opening messaging was all about the client and the client's problems, not his solutions. We got to his solutions eventually, but not before we dealt with the, with the problem, okay? Craft a branded LinkedIn profile. You can, you can pull copy from your website and repurpose it and create a LinkedIn profile in the about section. The about section is where you're going to want to do this because honestly, that's where a lot of people are going to find you. You're going to get referred. People are going to say, hey, call Greg. Hey, call Shimi, call you. And they're going to go right to your LinkedIn profile. And you want to have an about section that's compelling and that speaks to what you offer. Um, you're going to, you want to host your email and your hard drive. Thankfully, we've got Office 365. I'm a big believer in Office 365. It's extremely inexpensive. And you're, you're hosting your email and your heart, all of the data in your hard drive up in the cloud. I have, I have gotten through multiple computers and I never have a worry that I'm ever going to lose my computer because click of a button, it all comes down. Yeah, all of it, including what's in my hard drive, which is great. All right. So what are some of the, the things that could be, you know, sort of the, the stumbling blocks, all right? Discouragement at the first glitch. This is very, very normal. I, I just got to prepare you for this. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. You're getting all excited. You get ramped up. You get everything going. And then, uh -oh. oh, it's taking me too long to find my first client. Oh, I'm getting pushback from people. Oh, I've got to, whatever. You need to have some courage here. Have some faith. If this is something that you feel compelled to do, and may I say, if God is leading you in this direction, all right, please keep going, right? Take the time to, because it is, there's, there are so many people out there that need your help. So many people. And it's very easy to say, oh, I've been doing this for six months. I'm like, let me just go back to W2. A lot of people end up doing that. I really want to encourage you stick it out, <laughs> stick it out for as long as you can, because there are people who need your help, right? Again, expecting immediate results, not going to be an overnight thing. It's going to take some time. However, 
If you go back to your the, the, the community that you just came from, you are likely to have quicker results because those are the people who already know you, like you, trust you, and are more likely to be able to give you some quick wins and some quick business. A lot of times you can have lack of support from family and friends. A spouse might be more risk averse. You've got friends or, oh, that's ridiculous. KFC, we all know KFC, right? He was 65 years old when he started Kentucky Fried Chicken with like $8 in his pocket. He knew how to make fried chicken and he was able to sell. And sure enough, it turned to 65 years old. But if anybody would have told him, oh, ridiculous idea. It wasn't. <laughs> okay, you got to like really think about what you're doing here. And if you really believe in it, you got to take a risk. You might have insecurities about your abilities. If you if you feel like you have confidence in something, that could be the thing that you want to lean into. Maybe you don't have confidence in everything. Kathy just said, right? She doesn't do the kind of financial stuff that Greg does. That's fine. But what you do have confidence 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 in, lean into it. Keeping the pipeline full. You even when you start your business, you're going to you're going to have a tendency to try to focus on whatever's in front of you. Okay, I'm going to work on my client, work with this client but you always have to be doing some networking. You always have to keep keep keeping the pipeline full, pipeline meaning your prospects, the kinds of people who need to know about you so that when you end a project, you got have some other ones in the pipeline. Negotiating contracts can be a little bit tricky. Uh, managing your time and burnout, and guess what? Most of us are dealing with that anyway these days, even regular W2 people, because most people are working from home. You have to set boundaries. You have to manage your time. You have to say, I don't want to work past X time. Like for me, I don't really do evenings, but I will do weekends. I'll do Saturdays. That's how I extend my week because I, I work often with, you know, people like yourself. And so I need to extend my, extend my week, but I put some boundaries. I don't work Sundays. I don't take clients at eight o'clock at night typically, but I will extend it. So you have to think about what is work, what works for you. And then also develop a trusted network of colleagues. Like I was saying earlier, right? People who can support you, people who can mentor you. Um, you know, consider a small business coach. And if not somebody like me, that's fine. But if you're going to use somebody in your own life, that's totally fine. Um, but just make sure that it is somebody who doesn't have a dog in the hunt, not your best friend, not your spouse or significant other, not somebody who's too close to you. Work with somebody who's objective, who's really, and preferably somebody who has an, under, an understanding of the business world, okay? And then surround yourself with encouraging people. That's really one of the most important things. You got to get some love involved here. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I know we're running out of time and I do want to take some questions. So I'm going to just breeze through this. This piece, if somebody wants to do freelance work, I'm going to share this here. Oh, sorry. If you want to do freelance work, um, there are some, what's called the on-demand websites. My next slide is going to give you a whole bunch of them. Upwork and Fiverr and TaskRabbit. If you're looking for short-term freelance work, some gig work, if you will, you can go this route. There's a lot of competition with these sites, but there's kind of the quickie quicks. Actually, Uber and, and Lyft are considered um, on demand where consumers are sort of saying, hey, I need you to do X, Y, Z, and they will they will um, get you on that site. Um, if you are looking at the staffing route, staffing firms, here are a few that you may want to consider. Justin Bradley, um, they do a lot of different kinds of search, but they have a contract division. So if you want contract work, this isn't really self-employment as much as but might feel that way as a, as a contractor. I think Rachel is still there, Rachel Pellegrini. Uh, you can reach out to her. Flux Professionals, they do permanent part-time placement. So again, you're not exactly self-employed, but if you wanted to go something that's a little more flexible, you can go after them, flexjobs.com. You could also just Google, you know, contractor temporary staffing or part-time part flexible remote. If you don't really want to commit to the small business freelancy thing, but you want something that's not quite W-2, that's a route. Um, Again, how do you network, right? Um, again, go to associations, tap your former colleagues, your clubs, your places of worship, your friends, your neighbors. I got a, many years ago, my aerobics teacher became my client. <laughs> so you just never know where you're going to meet people. Um, and then thought leadership, right? The blogs, the articles, public speaking, educating your community around what you do. Um, and it is, this is particularly good if you want to establish yourself as a consultant. This pick, this, this, um, uh, slide if you want to take a picture of this. This is, again, this is on demand. I'm sure there's a million more than are on here now. This is from a while back, but these are some some um, on-demand sites that you may want to consider. Okay, And then where you can get some resources. So score.org is free. 
Um, so this is a nonprofit. They have, um, well, they used to be retired executives. That's what the RE stands for. Now it's a lot of other people. And you can, you know, do some free coaching with them. And I think they do like once a month coaching. The SBA does have some resources you may want to consider. If there are other solopreneurs in your network, meaning a solopreneur, meaning a an, an solo entrepreneur is somebody who's just you know, you're working solo. If you would like to coach with me, um, you know, here's my uh, email address and that particular link right there is the specific link to my small business coaching. And of course, Boomer works, right? You're already here. Um, but we do offer these free monthly virtual programs. And I will let you know that I'm going to be offering this one more often than we used to, because I noticed that there's just a lot of need and hunger for this. But uh, the other things that we used to do here, um, besides some of our niche programs, we used to have something that Michael and I used to host called a growth group. We might rename it, but it's basically going to, it's like a peer round table. So periodically we're going to, we'll, we'll have you guys come back if you'd like, and just an informal chat. So myself and Michael, we're happy to just give you like informal advice. Hey, I got a business all free, right? Just have, I have a question and can you be, basically do a little bit of informal mentoring? Uh, we're going to start offering those again. All right. So with that big fire hose. <laughs> okay. I'm hoping this is helpful for you. So I'd love to entertain some questions. We have another oh, five minutes or so left. Um, what resonated with you? Do you have a burning question about what I talked about? Did you have an aha moment? Um, how can I support you? Here, how do we uh, get on a mailing list so we could be kept on, um, informed about these upcoming round dates? Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to bring up, thank you for that. I'm going to bring up our Boomer Works site. So we are, we are on Meetup but we also have a mailing list. If you just go to boomerworks.org and go to our join here, our join button, join our community and just fill out a little form. I promise we will not spam you. <laughs> We're just gonna send you our monthly, uh, our monthly promos. That's it. Great, thank you, Shira. You're welcome. Hey, Shira, it's Shalom. So I have a question. So I, I'm currently working at you know, in a W-2 job. I've been in the legal admin field for like 30 years and I'm planning to probably do another five-ish, but I consider myself in the sort of R&D phase of my virtual assistant business because I'm trying to sort of create my client base out of the people that I'm either working for now or have worked for yeah, or know some uh, lawyers are like a community within themselves. They, they just know so many different people. Yeah. So, but the question that I had for you is how do you know when the time is right? Like, is there a certain amount of clients or do you do a business plan? Like, I mean, that might be a coaching I, thing that you and I have to do like offline, but sure. how do you know? I mean, if I can't, if I don't have to wait five years, I don't want to, but I may need to. Okay. So first of all, let me just back up for everybody else on the call. Okay. Um, to frame a little bit of what you're talking about, what you're talking about is what I call the move, move that bus. Okay. The extreme home makeover. So an extreme home makeover, what do they do? They kick the family out of the house, <laughs> they renovate the house, and then when before the before they're ready, they put a bus there, right? And then they move that bus, and ooh, the big reveal. Okay. You're talking about the big reveal. Yes, so, ma'am. Right. You're renovating the house, quite, quite, quite. So what I would recommend that you do is think about your own budget. What monetary threshold do you need to hit before you can move the bus? Okay. Think about it that way. I know of a, a, an old a friend who uh, worked in an accounting firm for many years. She was their office manager and she decided to do uh, residential real estate on the side. So she got her license and started selling homes on the weekend. And so one day she realized, oh, my income's at the right level. Ink. And then she quit. <laughs> okay. You just have to think about the monetary side and, and, okay. and that you have a pipeline. Like you just feel like there's your business is enough where, yeah, I could, it's sustainable now. But now mm -hmm. you're taking the slow boat, right? Yes. You're, you really are. And that you're seeing how long this takes. So if anybody right now is in W2 world and is doing what Shalom is doing, it will take you longer because you have a full-time job and then you're trying to do this other thing on the side. You can do it, but it takes longer. If you're not employed, right? I know that's more of a risk because you need a, you need a runway, but you know, it's quicker, right? Because then you're yeah. like, you, you can actually physically dedicate the time into, into growing the business. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right, another question. Hey, Shara, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. And you're always so altruistic about the way you give of your 
wisdom and your your great advice. Thank you so much. Um, I I did put in the question um, both to Michael and also to you. And Michael, thank you so much for offering your detail on your chat. That was very illuminating about your story uh, and very inspiring. Um, Shira, when you were recommending about a website, at what point do you feel a web page, like a web page site you are suggesting versus having a really well-developed LinkedIn, LinkedIn profile? profile. It's like you and I work together on branding right. and links in, in the LinkedIn page. Right. So when does it become advantageous to hop from there to? It's, it's, a, a, it's, a, great, it's a great question. So here's how I'm going to respond. It depends on how much credibility you want your business to have for people who don't know you yet. Here's what I mean. So small business, small business, not freelancers, small business, right? Where you have a brand. Most people are assuming if you're legit, you have a website, right? Most of us, right? You would expect Howard that I'd have a website. Okay. When you're starting out and you're really just kind of in your community, it's okay to just start out with a LinkedIn profile. But if you don't have a website, the people who don't yet know you, who are referred by, so like say, you know, Susie, okay? And Susie's fine with the fact that you've just got a LinkedIn page and that's fine. But when Susie starts referring colleagues or other people start referring business and that other person named John, who doesn't know you, but knows Susie, wants to check you out and only sees a LinkedIn profile, he's gonna say, oh, is he really legit? I mean, he's legit, but like, is he really like, is this a real business business? He's gonna want you to have a website. So I would suggest that as business starts coming in and you start feeling like you're getting a little bit of a reputation and you're getting some sea legs under you, I can't say how long that's gonna be, but you'll sort of know. I would then recommend, okay, it's time for a website. Now, by the way, you don't have to wait for that. <laughs> it is not hard to have a one page website. It's free to get a website to do one of the website builders like GoDaddy. Yes, you do have to spend the 30, 40 bucks on the, on the, on the hosting. So that might be a, le a legit thing for uh, consideration for, for people. But if you can afford that, there's no reason to me not to have it. If you are actually serious about your business. Now, if you're not now Shalom, for example, you're doing this on the side. Mm -hmm. So I LinkedIn for you, like, you might not need much of anything because you already have a word of mouth thing going on. Yes. But, right. But Howard, as you start to get clients and start to really, I mean, I know you've had lots of clients over the years, but like, but as you really feel like, Hey, I want to have a real presence, a real more sophisticated presence. That's when you're going to want to think about it. And I can't tell you the timing of that other than just keep in mind that the people who don't know your colleagues, they're going to want to go to a website to check you out. And they're assume you're going to have one. If you don't have one, it's okay, but it's better that you do because it's just the way of the world and people, what people expect. Yeah, thank you, Shara. Is there a lot of overlap though between LinkedIn and 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 a simple one or two page? There uh, is certainly website. overlap, but the one or the one or two pages is a little bit more in the depth, right? You can offer, you can describe your services a little bit more. You can describe the problems you're solving. Maybe there's a little bit of extra color there. The about section for LinkedIn is about twenty six hundred care uh, up to twenty six hundred characters, and it's supposed to be a little tighter than what you would find. So maybe maybe content wise, there isn't that much of a difference it's more the optics of it okay. the optics of having a legit, a legit website versus be, just being a linkedin profile so again but look there are people who don't do it and are, there's no there's no have to here you just have to make a good informed decision that people who don't know you will probably expect you to have one very good i know you can speak more to your target audience you can structure the content differently and testimonial exactly. that's right that's thank right. you uh, thank you so much you're welcome I know we're a little bit over time. If anybody wants to stay another minute or so, because I know I went over with the, the presentation. Any other questions I can support you with? Yeah, I'm looking to do organizational uh, organizational improvement. And so, however, I haven't, I don't have any skills in that area. So what do you think is the best approach to try to like become a, consider an expert in that area? Well, you're going to want to start with something that you do know. Like I would, I would pull that apart and explore why you want to get into that. And are there certain ing skills that you want to start developing into an ERG? Can you lean in and kind of develop that one piece of organizational improvement, right? Number right. one, number two, do research. Thankfully, we've got more information on the web than we can shake a stick at. You don't have to necessarily get a certificate yet, but I would do a lot of research around this area. 
I would go on LinkedIn and I would, I would find people who are, who are in your profession or in your business area. Start okay. seeing if you can set up some mentoring calls with people who are doing it right now, Expl have them explain to you the context and the problems that people tend to need to get solved and then what the market looks like. All kinds of people will be help more helpful than you realize. And again, just research, 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 articles and videos and right? <laughs> all these things. But I would do a lot of research. Then is if you can get a client to give you a little piece of it, you go a little bit deeper. In fact, I'm doing that right now. And Michael knows this. Michael was one of my people. Um, when I, uh, about two years ago now, I started a uh, strategic planning lane. Okay. I had never done that before, but I did. And I, Michael was one of the people I called and said, Hey, Michael, the advice. And, da, da, da. and he gave me some wonderful wisdom. Right. And I ended up, you know, thinking about that in terms of how I would. And so now I'm on my, I'm on my, thank the Lord. I'm on my fifth client with this and I got to start, but I had to like, you know, lean in. <laughs> I keep using that word this day, but I mean, it's true. You got to almost physically do that, but little by little by the little. Does that make sense? Yep. And eventually if you want to get certified in something, you certainly can, but you don't necessarily have to do that right now. Just research, talk to people, look it up. What are okay. the problems that, um, that need to be solved that you can do? All right. Thank you. Okay. Chair, I, I'm in a position like Greg, kind of going into a new, um, Avenue. And what are your thoughts? I've heard people say offer to do your services for free, like pick three prototypes to get some testimonials going. Not a, if you can afford it, not a bad way to go, but you, the people have to be super clear <laughs> why you're doing that. <laughs> and yes, if you can, that'd be great. In fact, if you can go to a former employer, it's a great one. In fact, they might even pay you. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go free. You can go low cost. It's good for people. And frankly, people invest with the people and people value what they invest in. So it's actually even to their benefit from to pay you something because they actually will psychologically get more out of the engagement than if they pay you nothing. Okay. So I would do that, but be super, super clear that it's a, it's a limited time for a limited number of people. This is not like you're suddenly your new low rate, mm -mm. very hard to go from a really low rate to a normal rate. It's for a very, you know, maybe it's six months, or maybe it's for my first 10 clients or my first three or my first two, or very on the QT. And you're just doing it with a few people, L limited scope. And then, um, and then you can, you know, feel free, more co confident to launch. You know, permit me to add that uh, you, you don't want a big sell here, but uh, presentations before service clubs, you know, Kiwanis, uh, JCs, uh, community organizations, or a way of getting your name out there. Again, make sure you're not overselling in those circumstances because that isn't what they want to hear. But that'll build your contact list. And a lot of those organizations have business people in them who will be looking for somebody who may need the service that you're offering. It's a great and point. Pay for it. It's a great point, Michael. There's so many free opportunities. If, you, if you're interested in public speaking, there's so many free opportunities to do that. There are business networking groups. Hi, Greg. There's some business networking groups all over the place, right? A little chapters of this and peer networking and all these things that would probably be very happy to have you come and speak. And then, you know, you're doing it for free, but it's a definitely a business development opportunity. So a lot of ways to kind of kick things off. And another question about rates. Is there a resource out there we can check rates if we don't know anyone who's doing exactly what we do? Or a little, that's just... tougher. It's not like there is no like that I know of. There's no salary.com. Mm -hmm. okay. Really, honestly, okay. you really do have to do some, some checking. And one of the ways that you can do that is to find people who typically hire people who do what you do and say on the QT, what do you typically pay for X, Y, and Z, right? Or other consultants. You'd be amazed the consult if you're doing the consulting thing. Many, many consultants are very giving of their time. I've, I've found that over the years, most consultants are very collegial, will help each other, even competitors. I say, what do you charge for this? Like, oh, I do this. I do that all the time. Me, I network with people a lot. Oh, I charge it. And I'll, I actually, Michael and I have a colleague, um, a, a woman, Michael, you'll know who I'm talking about in a second. And she does actually similar work to Michael. And she has a particular practice area. And I said to her, you know, so what do you charge? And she says, X. I go, oh, charging why <laughs> like telling i'm telling this guy like you need to charge more <laughs> right so like people will be much more receptive um and collegial than you might imagine so i would just just 
get out there and let people know what you're doing and, and people will often give you good advice. And you'll end up getting some testimonials as you go along that you put them up on your website or, you know, you ask people to like some article you put together on LinkedIn. It, it, it's, it's not a perfect, it's not a, a linear, 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 linear. <laughs> thank you, uh, pattern, you know, uh, uh, so don't think of it that way. And, you know, I know that uh, Cher mentioned this earlier, but BoomerWorks has wonderful resources. Uh, if you go to uh, uh, maybe Cher, bring it up. I'm going to bring it up right now. There you so go. We have a training center tab. Right. And the resources there are just really spectacular, you know, particularly for people getting started, which is, of course, what Boomer Work is, is trying to help people. That's do. what we're trying to do here. Yeah. So this right. particular tab, the resources tab, there's something called the business plan. We're, we're calling it a business plan template, which is a, another version of what some people call the business uh, canvas model. And it's just a way to think about how to, what your business model should look like. But we also want to take you to the training center. And so these programs are on the site. So for the last, what has it been, four and a half years that we've been doing these monthly programs, we have recorded almost every one of them. And you can just go to any one that you want and you go down and you can see, um, you know, you can see the videos that we, that we have, okay, from other, from, from our speakers. So it is definitely a DIY, okay? It does take some time to go through it, but hopefully you will um, get some good, good resources and tips from it. It's an excellent resource. And if, you know, if, if you're worried about marketing, you know, how do you get your name out there? How do you communicate? I can't tell you the number of uh, guests and free presentations that are sitting there with just wonderful advice for you. Yes. So lots, like, had like lots of said, it takes a little time, but, uh, uh, but it's worth every moment. Absolutely. Well, we do welcome you back. Thank you all for participating tonight. Hopefully it was helpful for you. And, it was uh, great, Shara. Thank you so much. You are so, Thank so you, welcome. Shira. You're so welcome. I'm actually going to put my um, my email in the chat. Actually, uh, Michael, would you do that as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can sure. both put our, our emails here in case you would like to reach out, say hello, link in with us, whatever you want. We are here to help. Yeah, and Shira, you, I, I did put in the chat too. Are you able to share the slide deck that you presented? Absolutely. Thank you for that. Okay. For anybody who wants a slide deck, here's the deal you need to email me because if you've signed up through meetup, we don't have access to email addresses. You must email me and say, I want the deck. Okay. <laughs> I don't Thank have you. any other way to reach folks. Okay. Thanks, Shira. Yeah, I'll, thank I'll, you. Have you. Have good night. I'll be in touch about coaching, Shira. Thank Sounds you, good night, good. everyone. All right. Good night. Have a blessed Bye. Day. Thank bye -bye. you. You too. Yeah. Bless. Bye-bye.